25 centuries ago, Greek philosophers were already teaching that matter is composed of indestructible fragments in continual movement, atoms which at the beginning of the world, chance or destiny had put together to make the material forms with which we are familiar. Through the ages, men have tried to answer the question, what is matter? In the 18th century, experimental science began to lift the veil. 150 years ago, Dalton described the atom as the smallest indivisible part of matter. In the early part of this century, Rutherford and Bohr visualized the atom as minute electrons whirling around a tiny, heavy central nucleus. But the structure of this small nucleus remained and still remains an enigma. Western Europe has been the birthplace of nuclear science. Men of brilliance have, in this century, attempted to solve the mystery of the ultimate constitution of matter. Niels Bohr was one who laid the foundations of nuclear physics. Together with such names as Becquerel, Rutherford and de Broglie, Chadwick and Cockcroft, Dirac and Einstein, Fermi and Heisenberg, Planck and Schrödinger. Unlike today's scientists who build and operate huge machines with which to bombard the nucleus and see what happens, the early scientists relied on natural radioactivity and cosmic rays for their experiments. Becquerel needed only a photographic plate for his discovery of radioactivity. Cascade generators, Van de Graaff machines and cyclotrons were the earlier accelerators. European physicists studied the effect of cosmic rays falling on the Earth from outer space. Experiments done with accelerators provide some factual knowledge of nature. Theory interprets the results and predicts what the next more refined, more powerful experiments might show. In turn, theory is then confirmed or contradicted by further experiment. Years ago, interest was mainly focused on mesons, the short-lived particles emerging from the bombarded nuclei of atoms. Mesons were thought to hold the secret of the forces binding the nucleus together. But they turned out to be only one member of a large family of particles locked up in the nucleus. And the energy needed to release the new particles could be provided only by accelerators far more powerful than any in existence. These new accelerating machines had to be built in Europe. They are the necessary tools of fundamental science and are essential if European scientists are to keep abreast of their colleagues of other parts. But such large accelerators cost large sums of money, and no individual country of Europe could afford them. Sharing the cost was the only way out. In 1952, 12 European nations agreed to join forces to build a laboratory to be equipped with two accelerating machines, one of which was to be one of the most powerful in the world. New generations of scientists could thus follow the men who, all over Europe, had founded and advanced nuclear physics in the first half of the century. CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, was born, and on a site near Geneva in Switzerland, work began at once. As the big laboratory took shape, Physicists, engineers, technicians, craftsmen, all from the countries of Europe came together in an enterprise of international cooperation whose product is scientific progress through research. The year, 1957. CERN starts operation. While the large accelerator is being built, experiments are already in progress on the smaller machine, the synchro cyclotron. Before such accelerators were available, mesons could only be observed occasionally in public rays. The synchro cyclotron could produce millions of them at will in the laboratory, and this gave scientists the opportunity of systematic measurements. The new machine soon proved itself a powerful tool, and in one of their first experiments, 
scientists working at CERN were able to discover a new form of meson disintegration. This is where it happened. Because of the intense radiation it produces, the accelerator must be controlled from a safe distance. Walls around the machine are 12 feet thick and the massive entrance door weighs over 100 tons. The machine cannot be started up until all exits have been sealed. The synchrocyclotron, a massive electromagnet, 3,000 tons of steel, 100 tons of aluminium. Huge pumps maintain a 30 cubic meter tank at high vacuum, and in this near void, a powerful radio frequency system whirls the particles around at speeds comparable with the speed of light. Through openings built into the shielding wall, mesons are shot into a large hall to strike a liquid hydrogen target. Electronic detectors and counters report the fate of those mesons which hit a nucleus in the target. Scientists at their observation posts discuss the next move in this intricate game. An oscilloscope screen displays the impulses. When the required combination of signal occurs, a photograph is taken for further study. Then, one day, a simple oscilloscope trace reveals that something new has happened. It is another stepping stone for a fresh departure larger accelerator. Nature's simplest atom, the atom of hydrogen, has a single proton as its nucleus and one satellite electron. Millions of these protons make a bunch of nuclear projectiles. A linear accelerator then shoots them into the synchrotron where a magnetic field guides them on a circular orbit inside an evacuated tube. In one second, the proton bunches make nearly half a million revolutions and cover some 200,000 miles. As the protons circulate, precisely timed electrical fields accelerate them while the magnetic field increases in intensity to keep them on the correct circular path. Travelling almost at the speed of light, the tiny projectiles acquire an energy equivalent to 25,000 million volts. When they have reached full energy, the protons smash into a target, producing streams of new particles whose properties are to be studied. In a liquid hydrogen bubble chamber, the tracks of the particles become visible as thin strings of bubbles. These tracks are photographed with stereoscopic cameras and from the study of the photographs can be deduced the laws governing the innermost structure of matter. A huge circular structure, 220 yards in diameter, lies buried underneath a concrete and earth mound in order to protect the outside world against radiation. This is the big atom smasher the proton synchrotron. In the year 1959, it is the largest and highest energy particle accelerator in the world.
The ring tunnel houses 100 magnet units, each weighing 38 tons. These guide the protons in their circular orbit. Between these magnet units, 16 accelerating stations give the proton sharp kicks of energy each time they go past. At other points around the ring are devices for detecting and adjusting the position of the circulating beams of protons within the narrow confines of the vacuum tube in which they travel. July the 10th, 1959, an important date for CERN. Completed and tested, the last of the magnet units is drawn into the ring building. The magnet units are mounted on a reinforced concrete ring, freely suspended to absorb shocks and ensure the complete stability of the machine. The position of each magnet is adjusted to within less than the thickness of a razor blade on a circle of 220 yards in diameter. Innumerable small details have to be checked before the machine is ready for its trial run. During the exciting days at the end of the construction period, the senior scientists of CERN paid frequent visits to the machine to discuss the latest problems. The protons rush round a stainless steel vacuum chamber in an oval tube six inches wide by three inches high and 680 yards in circumference. Its many sections are joined end to end and must be entirely free of leaks. 70 pumps arranged around the machine maintain a high vacuum in the chamber, a pressure of about one hundred millionth of the normal atmospheric air pressure. From any of the eight ring survey stations, a site can be taken on the center 110 yards away. The eight survey monuments define the geometry of the accelerator. They are used to align the magnet with watch-like precision. For some people, work is finished for the day. It's time to go home. Others, however, carry on with discussions in quiet surroundings, free from the daily routine. The theoreticians discuss a relationship between the facts disclosed by recent experiments. Their conclusions point the way towards new investigations, whose results, in turn, may give rise to new theories.
Besides this research into the fundamental structure of matter, other such are in the nucleus. Now, here is the One of these new means may be the plasma type accelerators, in which streams of particles flowing in opposite directions may produce still higher energies when they collide. Chemists study the effects of irradiation on metals and are able to make deductions on the life history of meteorites. Scientists from all over the world have come to help and the spirit of cooperation is as important to the life of CERN as the metal and glass and concrete. Now the proton synchrotron is almost ready to run for the first time. Final checks are made of the many components, each of them essential to the operation of the giant machine. In the half million volt generator inside the Faraday cage, the protons are being given the correct initial acceleration to start them on a journey almost as far as from the Earth to the Moon. They are injected in the linear accelerator from which they emerge as a 50 million electron volt proton beam, ready to enter the synchrotron ring. The main generator is started. This supplies the magnet with the 5,000 amps at 5,400 volts necessary for normal operation. This power is supplied in pulses every three seconds. Nous sommes prêts à vous donner une impulsion toutes les trois secondes. Attention, please. Being established will begin in 10 minutes. In the main control room, the magnet voltage and current are checked. Other oscilloscopes show the position and the intensity of the proton beam during the acceleration time of one second. In the vacuum chamber, the protons start moving at ever-increasing speed, much faster than the eye can follow. Miles of cables carry electrical signals telling how the acceleration is progressing. Waiting for the beam, the liquid hydrogen bubble chamber is ready to observe the nuclear disintegrations. Its cameras are set to record the tracks of the particles. The protons are going faster and faster towards top energy. After one second of acceleration, when they have reached very nearly the speed of light, they smash into a target and produce streams of secondary high-energy particles. The secondary particles are guided away to the bubble chamber. Some will interact with the nuclei of the liquid in the chamber and produce more particles. These are identified by the patterns they leave, stars, bees, curves. With one photograph taken every three seconds and tens of thousands in a single experiment, the study of the results becomes a formidable task. Special radar-like instruments are necessary. One by one, the bubble chamber photographs are scrutinized in order to select significant events. 
The tracks left by the particles are accurately measured and the measurements are fed into an electronic computing machine. From the output of the computer, in a very abstract form, comes finally knowledge of what has taken place in the nucleus. The results are not intended to produce practical applications. This research is designed solely to increase our understanding of the world in which we live. Whether we look at the infinitely small nuclei or at the infinitely large galaxies far outside our little world, we see in nature echoing patterns whose laws we partly comprehend, but whose beauty is beyond our description.